Welcome to the Develop Yourself podcast, where we teach you everything you need to land your first job as a software developer by learning to develop yourself, your skills, your network, and more. I'm Brian, your host. Yo, before we get into today's episode where I interview Alex Lau, an accomplished software engineer and the author of an amazing book, Keep Calm and Code On, I want to let you know that this is the last week which you can apply and get a major discount on Parsity. Work with me one-on-one to pass our admissions challenge and be one of the last four remaining spots out of only 10 for the upcoming and last cohort of the year. Can't wait to work with those of you who choose to take me up on this, and I hope you enjoy this episode. All right, today on the Develop Yourself podcast, I have Alex Lau, software engineer, engineering leader, and author of Keep Calm and Code On, a book that I'm currently yes. reading that I genuinely find so useful. It's one of those books that I'm reading like, oh, me too. And I'm looking at all the things, all the mistakes that you've made that I thought, oh man, I've, you know, who else has made this mistake? You feel alone a lot of times. And now reading this book, I'm like, where was this book five years ago when I could have really used it? But anyway, welcome to the show. Really happy to have you on here today. Excited to talk about this book and also share yeah, some of our own pitfalls in software engineering. I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be really exciting to hear the ones that you're going to be sharing. And some of them are taken from my book, but we'll be able to also elaborate in different ways that I don't cover as much either. I'm curious what inspired yeah. you to write this book, share your struggles, the pitfalls, and then how to avoid these yeah. pitfalls. I've been like wanting to start a blog at first and just kind of been collecting different ideas and themes and I had a lot of false starts with blogs in the past. And so for this time, I was trying to just have like build up a good collection of things to write about before I even started so that it wouldn't just be, you know, a lot of time you focus on something for like two or three weeks really intensely. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of falls by the wayside when you lose momentum in it. So I gathered all these stories and then to notice that this theme sort of emerge from the stories that I collected and this theme of making mistakes. And also just, it felt like something that I was very comfortable talking about was being open with my mistakes and kind of owning up to them, as opposed to a lot of the time when I think of books, I think of, oh, this guy is the best Rubyist out yes. there and he's the authority on it and he's going to tell me everything and yeah. everything he says is going to be perfect. Whereas I, I feel like I'm a very effective software developer, but I, I don't think it's because I'm the most naturally talented, mm-hmm. smartest person. If anything, I, I think it's kind of the opposite of that. I think I've made it work in spite of my natural gifts <laughs> or, or lack thereof uh-huh. in some ways. But I think there's a lot to be said for not necessarily being the smartest person in the room, but still being a great software developer by being strategic in your approach and like thinking about problems the right way. Like a lot of the times software doesn't have to be created by the best, most like naturally rawly smart person. It's really just about having a thoughtful approach and like being diligent in the way that you think about software. Yeah. That's a huge misconception that uh, I take for granted because I meet a lot of people. I own a bootcamp now and I'm also a software developer and I meet people that are really at the beginning stages of their career, and they have this idea that I'm, I'm either not smart enough or that, you know, you have to have this like super high level command of the, the language that you're using to construct programs. And yeah, and I'd say that I don't, first of all, I don't believe that like anybody can code, honestly. Like I believe that anybody can code in the same way that like anybody can get a six pack. Um, <laughs> for some of us yeah. your your natural ability and your level of discipline and other factors will will determine the difficulty that you approach this profession with sure yeah that that analogy is going to stick with me for a long time i love that right because it really does go to highlight that everybody's path is different for sure. and for some people you're naturally it like plays to your wheelhouse of your skill set for other people you can still get there, but you're going to have to have a different approach than somebody else is going to have. Yeah. And I've never thought of myself as the best coder. I've, I've only been like the best coder on one team. And in general, I've been somewhere near the middle, maybe on maybe a little bit on the higher range, sometimes on the lower range. Um, but yeah. what I respect from other people, like people that I've looked up to at different roles is people that had like a lot of grit. Because some people just go in there and they've been coding since they were 12. And you think this is, yeah. this is not difficult for you. And, and I still have a level of like respect and, and awe for that, but I really respect the people that get in there and they just make it work. They're like, I'm going to figure this out, whether they were self-taught, went to boot camp or college, 
and they get into this profession and they're like, I'm going to figure this out. People don't think about like your code ultimately is supposed to be in service of a business. They're, they're paying you money. They want to make money. You're kind of, you kind of have to think on that level at, at some point in your career. It has to be more than just writing code and, and pumping it out. I, it completely resonates with me. Uh, I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit by even giving this anecdote, but I, I was going into college right after the dot-com bubble had burst. And so it's, it's funny to say it today, but like at the time there were a lot of people that were kind of telling me, are you sure you want to be in computer science? There's not going to be a demand for it. They're just going to outsource everything. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Right. History repeats itself. Um, and the thing that I've realized over the years, I mean, obviously, first off, since then, there's been such a huge demand, like greater than I ever even could have anticipated when I was picking my major in college. But I think like a large part of that is because companies did try to do exactly what people were telling me of, like they tried to just outsource everything. And I think what a lot of them realized was that there is more than just writing code. Like you can yeah. you can have anybody just write the code, but you have to kind of get what you're pointing to of like having an understanding of what the problems you're trying to solve are and having that larger context around it rather than just like, here's this feature because you don't even know, are you building the right feature? Are you making these right trade-offs? Are you doing it in such a way that's going to set you up for success tomorrow and in the future? And are you understanding this larger scope that you're being asked to um, kind of like implement and add to a given product? Yo, man, a hundred percent. I'd even say that's like directly correlated with your salary. I'm really interested, by the way, to talk about some of our biggest mistakes, which is something we had talked about before the show. And you're like, how comfortable do you feel like talking about some of the biggest mistakes (laughs) you made? I'm like, you know what? I'm totally down. I think that's a fun thing to talk about because I like kind of talking about past mistakes and hopefully helping people avoid them, similar to what you've done in the book. So yeah, I want to kick it off, man, and I'll let you go first. If you want to share, <laughs> okay, yeah. what are some of the, what's one of the biggest mistakes you've made in your career so far? The first one that comes to mind is having what I call a high pain tolerance for things. So what I mean by this is you'll commonly see this on teams where you have like an, a really elaborate dev setup and like environment setup where, you know, you don't do it that often. So you're maybe willing to uh, be okay with some of the, more painful things that are involved. They're doing like these weird steps where it's like, you know, just run this one script or set this environment variable or do X, Y, Z. That's kind of cumbersome, but you're only setting up your dev machine maybe once every six months if something terrible happens, right? And so I think it's easy to kind of just ignore those problems or like be okay with them for smaller periods of time. But uh, if you think about it, by doing that, you're kind of just applying a Band-Aid to a problem, right? Rather than addressing the root problem itself and making it easier for other developers who are onboarding later on in their team. Or again, when you have to go in and reset up uh, the project yourself. Like I think there's a lot to be said for the resiliency of, in this case, being able to, like, if in theory, as like a thought experiment, you needed to set up your dev environment every single day, like, how painful would that be on a scale of one to 10? Yeah. If the thought of that is <laughs> just like terrifying to you, that's probably an indicator that there's a lot of room for improvement, right? Whereas if it's, uh, you know, a two or a three on that scale, it's like, yeah, you could do it. And there'd be like some weird things that you have to do. Maybe that's a better balance to be striving for because it means that you've automated a lot of the tough parts mm-hmm. out of it, but there's still like one or two things that would maybe be really hard to fix and just aren't worth the effort, right? Like I think as with many things in software development, it's about finding that right balance, not going too extreme. And like, you know, we only want it to be the least painful process, uh, regardless of how much time and effort it takes to kind of like wash away that tech debt um, versus like having it be extremely, extremely painful, right? Like finding that right balance between what you're willing to take on and what big problems and low hanging fruit you're able to solve, I think is um a really thoughtful way to approach that. It's a really good one because I just started a new job and this happens every time you start a new job, right? You go on there and there's, and the yeah. setup is more complex than you wish it would be. This job actually has been great, but I started another job weeks before this. It's been a, it's been a wild couple months. Yeah. New jobs. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and you're right. If you don't onboard people a lot, you can get used to these weird processes that you just get used to. You're like, oh yeah, this is the way we do things. 
we you have oh you got to email this person to get this environment variable that they'll email you and then yes. then you put in here don't worry you just got to do it once then you onboard ten people and you realize oh my god this is going to be super annoying to do having that high pain tolerance and it doesn't usually show up until like somebody new comes along or some new something new crops right. up that illuminates it at a not ideal time <laughs> yeah I guess the the thing I would add too is that if you are that new person and it is painful, like that's really a time for you to shine and, you know, pay it forward. You have that fresh perspective on a team and fresh pair of eyes. And you might realize that something is painful when other people didn't as well. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing I would add for this one is that although the example I gave is for a dev setup, it doesn't just apply to that, right? It can be an entire like subsystem in code where, you know, if you're really fearful of touching one area of code or making a change, yep. um, you know, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Where, yeah, it's like uh, if you only have to touch that, you know, email reporting system or whatever once every six months, maybe it's not worth refactoring everything. But if you're in there, you know, once every week or two and it's always scary, then it's you probably have a really good case to, to build for your manager or your team to go in and refactor that and take care of that tech debt. Or, or if somebody's first name is in front of that task. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, oh, exactly. That's Susie's. Susie always does <laughs> yeah. that. That update. Um, <laughs> Just have her do it. It's way yeah. too complicated for us to figure out. You say, okay, this, yeah. this is likely an indication. I, I should, I should mess with this thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. And cause you don't want to be, you want Susie to live her life. Yeah, too. Right? You want her to be able to go on and like it you know someday she's gonna leave the company and you don't want that to be a really scary thing you want to be ready for that day yeah yeah for real the, the vacation thing too then they go off or they get fired or they leave it was like oh no yeah i wish they were here you know <laughs> um i it's yeah. similar to that my one of my biggest mistakes i did this a lot when i first got hired uh making things work at all costs performance be damned mm-hmm. you know this is one of those things that we spoke about a little bit before this and even talk about in the book. But I, I got hired and I was self-taught for the most part. I went to a boot camp and I was in charge of creating these ordering systems for a large grocery store. Like a, it was a billion sure. dollar business. We had tons of orders coming in from the grocery store owners. And what I did is I ended up writing a triple nested for loop that had <laughs> an asynchronous task at the end of this insane for loop that, you know, would resolve yeah. at some point. And I would await this promise. And it, this worked pretty well, actually, when you had 10 people online, you know, didn't mm. block up the system. Yeah. The moment we had, we saw at 3 p.m., the system like spiked and it just essentially crashed or it brought it to such a crawl that it was almost unusable. Sure. And they were thinking, what, what's going on here? How is this? Po-? And then they looked at the code and said, who wrote this? I'm like, oh, <laughs> that was me, you know? And I got it yes. done on time and they're like, well, this is like this. And I didn't think about these things. I had no clue about big O notation or just like the idea that how will this perform once more pressure is applied to it or more users or more data is mm-hmm. given to it. Same thing. I had my most infamous code that I'm the most ashamed of probably. It was a hundred line, no lie, hundred line if else statement that would check a series of conditions to know whether you should give a person a refund or not in this same company mm. I was working at. I'm shocked, I'm shocked they didn't fire me actually for this stuff. <laughs> now that I think of it, they had a lot of patience guess, for me. Yes. <laughs> they were very nice people. Uh, I feel like both those examples are so relatable, right? We've all kind of been there and like been really in the weeds of wanting to make a request. And, um, you know, when you're working with a stakeholder, I, I don't know about you, but I think for me personally, like there's certainly a sense of ego that kind of gets in the way too of like wanting to prove that I can do it. Oh, yeah. Like if I can't, that's of me not being up to snuff as a developer, right? But um, what's funny is I feel like in reality, the opposite is true, right? Like part of being a good developer is coming up with those right solutions Mm -hmm. that are going to be performant and are going to try to get, um, you know, the underlying stakeholders requests done as well. So I'm I'm actually curious to hear, like, as you reflect on this, what you have done differently, like where in the process for software development, like would you have kind of tried to push back or maybe like brainstorm other solutions? Like, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but I do think about that. I'm like, could I have caught that? And yes, I there was there was a, something in the back of my head saying, this isn't right. You know, this doesn't seem right. This is this works, and I thought, but this doesn't fit. And I should have dug into that and pulled on that string a little more. 
and and kind of gone and kind of led my curiosity down. I think I think processes also could have stopped this thing. There was no code reviews mm. at the time either. This is the kind of thing that nowadays most software teams have code reviews. Every software team I've been on since then has more thorough code reviews, and you would have caught this kind of thing and said, "Hey, wait a second, what are, what are you doing exactly? You know, let's let's take a step back and and do this right." But um, yeah, I should have definitely followed my curiosity and just kind of thought, "Is there a better approach for this?" Also, understanding patterns. Um, I didn't even understand at this mm -hmm. at this stage age that there are already tried and true solutions to basically everything I was trying to do. I just needed to go out yes. and and look for them and understand that they existed. So I think that's another pitfall potentially of being self-taught that you you don't even know what you don't know. And that's really hard to right. solve for because you're just so out yeah, there. Yeah, it's know? not not easily asked on Stack Overflow, right? And yeah. I actually think that's, that plays in well with what you were, uh, your previous point too of um, really leveraging code review and and this like morning that morning bell that's going off in your head right. of uh, one thing I try to do now is rather than wait until I think my code is pristine and putting it up for code review if I'm in like a similar situation I try to just get it out there as fast as possible yeah. make use of draft PRs try to have like a discussion with my teammates and, and bounce ideas off them where I'm like hey you know I think that there is maybe a better way for me to solve this problem I'm not sure exactly what it would be called or like what patterns to follow or you know if there's like a library that would handle this for me or anything like that so i'll just get it into a, a minimal state of kind of proof of concept or even like code that doesn't work and yeah. it's like this is generally what i'm trying to do but it's enough to convey my point and get their feedback because you know it totally makes sense that one single engineer on the team isn't going to have this entire library of all mm -hmm. solutions possible in their head. But as soon as you bring it up to, you know, three or four devs on the team, that gives you so many more options and opinions to kind of draw from in their experience as well. So I think that that's always really effective. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point. And, I, and if I'm being honest, I, I was just embarrassed at that stage to do that kind of thing. Sure. I was scared of yeah. what they might say. And I was just fearful. I was like, if I show them this, are they going to like judge me and really think I'm dumb? I, I'm just trying to prove myself here. And that held me back a lot. That that ego um, wasn't helpful. When I dropped the ego and I opened myself much more up to expose my ignorance and kind of just admit when I don't know things. And I try to do that a yes. lot now saying, hey, you know, what do you think of this? You know, does this make sense? Because I don't want to go down too far into a solution without getting some verification if i'm not sure about it if i'm sure about yes. it i'm like yeah i'm pretty confident but if i'm not you're right I, I i do the things you said draft prs if you're not familiar with that that's a it's a github feature i think probably on bitbucket too where you can put a pr in draft mode and say hey just take a look at this before i make it official these are really good practical things you can do um, yeah yeah you're you're certainly not alone in that idea of like just having that ego and like wanting to kind of like protect your code yeah. and being, being fearful of asking questions. Like I 100% was the same way, especially earlier on in my career. And one thing I talk about a lot is this mental shift that I've had over the years of thinking of code review uh, rather than it being a time where I'm proposing my code mm -hmm. and then any comments that I get, I'm like trying to defend my solution. Yeah. Uh, then I try to think of it as we're, we're a team of software developers, right? And the goal of code review isn't for one person to propose something and then have them defend it like I was doing, but rather as a team, how do we come up with the best solution? Like, I don't care if I'm not the one writing a certain bit of code. Like, I care that what we merge into production is the best solution that we can think of at the time. What's another big mistake you've made? Over the, years? the next one that I had is actually very much in line with what you had just talked about. I, I call it defaulting to yes. Mm. So again, it's this idea of whenever somebody asks you to do something, having your default mentality. So like if I'm, if I have a ticket in front of me and it has, you know, five different parts of this feature that it's requesting um, and having my default mode of being, oh yeah, I'm going to fulfill all five of these things on this ticket mm -hmm. rather than taking a step back to actually analyze and think about and go back and forth with somebody about, well, what's the underlying problem we're trying to solve or what's the underlying value we're providing 
to a given user on this? Like, do we actually need all these pieces for it? And again, I think a big part of the reason that I had fallen victim to this pitfall in the past is because I was attempting to prove what a great engineer I was, right? And in my mind, it was, there was this idea that only the best engineers would be able to just solve every single problem. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It didn't even occur to me that there's a lot of power in saying no, or even just like reshaping and reforming a request to better fit the problem at hand. It, it, I feel like it really does break down to communication at its core, which leads me to yeah. my probably the biggest yeah. mistake I think I made in my career to being really quiet, which I thought was playing it safe. I, mm-hmm. I kind of did what you were talking about. I just nodded my head, just said yes to basically everything. Somebody said in a meeting, we should use this. I just was like, sit, I sat back and was like, I don't want to rock the boat. Who am I to say anything? You know, these people are smarter than me. They know way more. And so I would just default to being the quiet guy. This actually worked okay for a couple of years, to be honest. Like I just kind of played the background. And I think bigger companies, you could easily fall into this trap where, yeah. you know, you, you can basically keep your job, <laughs> but it's going to be really hard for you to get anywhere else. But this came to a head when I went to a startup, a really small one, and I, I thought I could do this at a five-person startup. Ten, it was 10 people at max. <laughs> yeah, a lot tougher then, right? Yeah, right? So it's hard, it's tougher to just play the background. And then the CTO took me out for a, a one-on-one one day. We were walking around San Francisco. And he's yeah. like, hey, man, why do you never say anything in meetings? And he just like just straight up asked me. I said, well, you know, you guys are like, you're, you're a CTO. And the other guy like wrote this Ruby library. You know, who, I'm just some dude. I don't know. I'm like, I, I'm just here to try to learn. Yes. He's like, well, we yeah. kind of need you to say something he's like because like i am like the cto this guy is like been writing code for 25 years like we have we're so stuck in our ways and opinions like we need yeah. we're trying to build this product to be profitable this is not like a coding problems we're always trying to solve so like we we want opinions and things like that and i was like oh no now i can't hide anymore so i started like figuring out like <laughs> ways to to talk essentially at work which is so funny because now i talk to people all the time and i really enjoy it but for yeah. a long time that was just not my way of doing things at all. I was very quiet, really helped my career though, in general, like learning how to have an opinion um, or, you know, when I actually yes. had something to say, learning how to say it and, and speak to people just helped out so much. Yeah. Thank goodness for that manager. Right. It sounds oh, like yeah. he really yeah. he asked you what you needed to be asked at that time and helped you grow a lot. And, you know, oftentimes growing means getting out of your comfort zone. Right. And so it sounds like you were able to, to overcome that. Is there anything like, is there like one specific thing or like a handful of things that helped you really come out of your shell and be able to ask more questions? Yeah. You know, I was so nervous. I mean, I used to have anxiety attacks, honestly, a lot mm-hmm. in my late 20s. Yeah. And I used to have these terrible yeah. panic attacks. And I st- I've had to learn how to calm those down through things like meditation. Uh, I also got sure. sober, you know, 10 years ago. And that kind of also yes. uh, made those go away for the most part. But one thing I get really anxious and so what I would do is before meeting, sometimes I'd read up on what we were going to talk about and I'd try to find out information and I'd have pre-written questions. <laughs> so I'd go to the meeting and just kind of read off this paper I mean, and just yeah. ask questions off my paper. A little embarrassed to admit that, think, but that's what I, mean, I did. I mean, that honestly, I mean, it shows me that you're taking so much initiative and you take your job seriously, right? And, you know, in the same way that uh, one skill I've really tried to develop over the years is getting better at public speaking. I think there's like a lot of parallels there where, you know, at first I had like my written notes that I would have to kind of just go directly off of. And then gradually over time, after I got comfortable with that, that's what unlocked the next step for me in that journey. Right. And I think there shouldn't be any shame in, you know, much like your six pack analogy, like it's different for everybody, right? It's a different process. And like, whatever gets you there, like that's Sure, it might be less conventional, but I don't think it should inherently be shameful, though I will admit it's sometimes easier said than done, right? There is just like certain things we tend to get more embarrassed about whether we want to or not. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, I'm glad to hear that for you too, because I assume you meet people at a certain stage of their life and you think, oh, this person, they must have had this figured out forever, right? Like I meet you, you seem very well put together. You've written a book and people think, oh, Alex, he's got it figured out. And I think it's cool when we open 
we peeled the curtain back and we said, hey, I'm still trying to figure out these things too. Like you said, you're trying yeah. to figure out marketing. You wrote this excellent book and then you're like, well, how do I get people to read the book? Now I got to go out there and do these things that I don't know how to do and figure these things out. And now you're probably, yes. you know, getting into some pitfalls that you'll see 10 years from now that you say, oh, that's the thing I could have avoided now that I'm in this next <laughs> yeah. best-selling book. And here's how you can avoid <laughs> this on the next on the next thing I do. That's certainly, I mean, even from a sheer software development standpoint, uh, even besides all the stuff like going very blatantly out of my comfort zone, even the things where it's like, I've been doing this for, you know, over 15 years at this point, And I still like, there's really smart people on my team that I work with all the time. And I can't help, but you know, there's a sense that there's always like the bigger fish, right? right? Yeah. There's always somebody who's like smarter and they seem, you know, even more put together and yep. they just know like not only all the the intricacies of this library, but they know like way more about DevOps than I do. And like, they have all these other skills. Um, but I will say one thing I've certainly grown to appreciate over the mm -hmm. years is just having diversity on different teams. And like, I, I mean that in a, in the sense that like, it's really nice to just have people that think about problems differently oh, yeah. and approach problems differently and kind of be able to learn from them. In addition to having people that like, uh, it specialized more on the back end versus the mm -hmm. front end versus other part of the stack, right? Like it's so great to have all those things. And uh, again, I, I'm like ashamed to admit that it, at one point in my career, I thought I just like had it all figured out. And like, I knew the best way to approach all these things. And then, you know, as time and experience has shown me, that's certainly not the case. And if anything, I really try to value, you know, watching how other people approach problems and like, you know, teammates working on this project than they do like, xyz to get it prototyped really quickly and they try to like make sure they're testing this thing and this thing where it's like oh yeah i wouldn't have done that in the same order of operations mm -hmm. but i really appreciate you taking this path and like talking about it with the team and like just kind of being able to observe and learn from other people is such a great thing to have and is often it can be overlooked really easily right if you're kind of just focused on what you're working on rather than like paying attention to the people that you get to interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. When a lot of people talk about diversity, we think, you know, uh, sex, religion, race, and things like that, but it's really important too, like the diversity of thought, just because somebody's a different complexion or, you know, sex than you doesn't mean always that you have a different way of approaching things. So having people right. that, like look at problems, it's so important. It, it, it also helps teams come up and challenge each other, come up with better solutions expose you to yeah. different ways of thinking, which can then color your way of thinking. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yes. I've worked with people like from MIT to the self-taught person to the person that didn't even graduate high school. And I was like, it was cool to watch the ways that they all approached problems and then hashed them out and yeah. then would solve them in, in different ways they thought. It's It's been great talking with you, Alex. Um, really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah. I'm enjoying reading this book that I just can't <laughs> recommend Thank Enough. you again so much. Yeah. Um, any last words of advice for our audience? Um, I really liked your point earlier of just trying to optimize for learning and have like a, you know, I talk about this in the book a little bit, like a beginner's mindset where you're not ashamed of this idea of like thinking that I should just know everything all the time, right? Like I think the biggest, if there's like one thing that I can go back and tell myself earlier on in my career, it's just like, be really open to learning from others and like not being so hard on myself when I didn't have everything figured out because you, you'll never have everything figured out. Right. And like the best thing you can do for yourself is be forgiving in that way. And I think by embracing that you ironically do a lot better because you're like more open to it and it just leads to a lot better paths for um, growing in your career. I, yeah, I totally agree. Some of these lessons has taken me a really long time to learn. I hope that people listening to this can take some of this, understand that, hey, maybe you're looking at Alex or me or whoever, understand we're all figuring this out. We're all making mistakes that we'll be talking about and figuring out years from now and looking back on. And uh, yeah, I think that hopefully you can take some of this and apply it to your own career, no matter what stage you're in. And if people want to find your book or find you online, what's the best place to, to do that? For both of those things, you can just go to my book's website, keepcalmandcodeon.com. It has both information about the book. It'll have soon that upcoming blog that I was talking about, as well as like the about page has my LinkedIn and email that you can reach out to me directly for. I love hearing from anybody, uh, especially if you've read the book, but even in general, just to say hi, I'd love to hear from anybody out there. It's really, I like that. It's really awesome. Yeah. Thanks. The link to that will be in the show notes. 
and also in the email if you're subscribed to that. Thank you so much, Alex. Really great having you on today. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brian. Thanks for having me on. That'll do it for today's episode of the Develop Yourself podcast. To learn more about becoming a software engineer with us, then check out Farsity.io. If you're not quite ready for that, then jump into our dev30.xyz program, which is 30 days of working on your mindset, habits, and JavaScript skills. Totally worth it. See you next week.